sticking with the process and being stubborn, being uh, like very, very patient and, and being uh, doing your due diligence and working hard. I think that's the hardest problem, but the hardest challenge, just being consistent and always putting in the good work and know when to make a break so that you don't get into too many burnouts. And like, I think that's, that's the hardest part, like being not giving up and being persistent. That's probably the, 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 the biggest challenge. All right, so hello everyone and welcome to the AI Stories podcast. I'm Neil Lizer, I'm a data scientist at IWOCA, and I will be your host. So today, our guest is Alexa Gordich. Alexa first studied electronics and computer science at the University of Belgrade in Serbia. And after that, he actually transitions to the world of software engineering, and he works at Microsoft for three years. After that, he actually decides to move to the world of AI and machine learning, and he actually starts learning on his own. Without any bachelor, master, or even PhD, he actually manages to land a job at Google DeepMind, where he is now a research engineer. So today, we're going to talk about Alexa's career, about getting into AI, about Google DeepMind, and some of the latest AI algorithms. So if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to subscribe to the AI Stories YouTube channel and follow Alexa and me on Twitter and LinkedIn. All right, so let's start the conversation now. Hi, Alexa, really looking forward to chatting with you. How are you today? Awesome, Neil. Well, uh, thank you for, for the invite. And just like a short, uh, like just a short uh, typo you made, like I did finish the bachelor. It's just that I don't have any official machine learning uh, background. That's that's the that's the trick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I, I was saying. Bachelor, master, or PhD in machine learning or in the field. Um, that's true. Yeah. Th thanks for the invite again. Like, uh, yeah, I just finished my my daily job, so probably will not be that sharp. But hopefully, your your viewers will have some some value out of this whole conversation. Yeah, I hope so. I'm sure it will be super interesting. And yeah, thanks a lot for joining. We've been chatting for some time now. So yeah, great to looking forward to recording this episode. Same here. All right. So just want to start first with your bachelor, as we mentioned, and your past in Serbia. What did you study and why did you study this field? And yeah, how did you find it? How was it? Let's start with the beginning. Yeah, my, my story is kind of like weird in the sense that like uh, I, the reason I started studying electrical engineering was purely like it was like a challenge for me. Like I was I was 19. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I was like, OK, there is this very, very hard like faculty in, in Serbia, in Belgrade. It was like considered one of the toughest ones in, in, in Belgrade and Serbia. And I was like, let's let's go for it. Like I literally I, I did not have like a clear vision. Hey, I want to be this like this tech guy. Like I, to be honest, I, I knew a little just a little bit about what programming is and what it means to be a programmer and how it's like a daily job in a programmer's life look like. And so it was kind of ad hoc, mostly challenge. And then yeah, I basically started studying electrical engineering. And then like after first year, like I was like now we are supposed to 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 pick which which uh, subject we want to study, mm -hmm. whether computer science or whatnot. And I decided to study electronics. And again, the reason was fairly simple. Like it was considered the hardest like module on my whole faculty. And I like I was just, I, I'm just a attracted for some weird reason to to hard stuff. And not only that, it's also because like I didn't want to have things like being to be black box. So I, I really like understanding what's going on under the hood of our computers and stuff. And then after spending a couple of years there, like I realized, okay, like enough is enough. There is infinite levels of complexity. You can you can kind of disclose. You can go depending on the scale. You can go all the way to like uh, like hardware, like bare metal, and then obviously physics, like quantum physics. So you have to stop somewhere and kind of say, okay, I'm gonna abstract away this this like uh, bottom layers, like. And and so for me, basically electronics, I figure out like, okay, I I don't want to go any deeper. This is this is enough. And, and yeah, that's. It's roughly it. So you just you chose your courses based on the ones that were the most challenging, and and that's it. 
yeah plus as i said i want you to understand how stuff works and and that's then naturally the two kind of aligned uh like yeah that's that's what i picked electronics but then we can get into that now or later i i started pivoting to to software engineering because like uh electronics as a field is very is very closed relatively speaking compared to software engineering so there is not as many opportunities uh like you don't have these like cool hackathons being organized uh stuff like that mm -hmm. and yeah basically because of that and plus the salaries were, were nowhere near as as those you get like that, that's a component we need to be honest here like that, that's definitely a component that, that played a role for me and so i decided to kind of pivot to software engineering and then started like self-studying like learning like more about android programming and 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 yeah, then the, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> so how do you transition to software engineering? Is it like one day you just say, okay, let's move to software engineering. Uh, I'm not going to get super high salary in electronics. So let's move to this field. How, how does it work? Not exactly. So even though I say it's electronics, like we, we also had like many programming courses. We, we had like digital image processing, this and that. And so I was already exposed, probably it's misleading to say electronics, maybe it's better to say like electrical engineering and computer science, or it's very, very broad, but like kind of specializes in electronics. So I think it happened when I was like fourth year of, of my undergrad studies, I decided to, I, I, I got some internships, like one of those were, uh, was in Germany, and I was supposed to work there as Android developer. And since I did not have that much like uh, experience in Android, I just started learning, doing some UDST courses. And that's my, like, I have this whole, like say self-education thing. We can get into that later as well. Like, and so I just taught myself Android and uh, landed that internship. And that inter internship was kind of the, 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 the breaking point for me because I started chatting with some of my very successful friends who were doing, like at that point already had some internships like in Google, Facebook, Jane Street behind them. Whereas I'm, I was like kind of lagging behind. So I had this constant battle and my lagging behind and, and this constant self-doubt, which I, I guess many of your, of your viewers will be able to empathize with. So yeah, same for yeah, me. I think, yes. yeah, I think it's very necessary to, to, to state, state that out loud. I think that most people like even very, very like, very good people, like professional experts, like feel this this imposter syndrome. It's it's like real. You always see so many people around you, and you always compare. And because of the nature of internet, you compare yourself with the best uh, people out there in the world. And so you're, you're not being really realistic. But yeah, everyone has this syndrome, or at least a lot of people. I hear it so many times. So what do you do to try to fight this and still do great stuff? Um, while thinking that, oh, maybe I'm not the best, or maybe I'm a fraud, or maybe I shouldn't be here. What do you do to, to fight this? Yeah, I guess you just start grinding. You start working and working and working and working and putting stuff out there and putting yourself out there and trying and applying and failing and again and again. Like I failed many times. Like I had many uh, like failures. I tried to apply for like Facebook, Microsoft also. Like I, I wasn't successful on the first try. I, like, this is more of a rule than an exception. Like, to be honest, like, like most people like fail. It's not always that you are like, don't have enough knowledge. Sometimes it's just like, Hey, we don't have a headcount or, or whatnot. Like, Hey, we, we, like, we don't think you'll be a great cultural fit because I don't know, you're too ext extroverted or too introverted or like something, something that's like your, your trait that they don't like and they can, they can kind of fire you or, or, like, or it can also be just noise. Like you had a bad day and you couldn't focus and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I feel it's also you when you analyze other other people, you think they're perfect or they don't have any doubts or they don't everything they do is always great. Maybe also because of social media, you see people posting and you think, wow, they're they're so great. They all yeah. their analysis are perfect. And me, I need to think, I have some doubts. And so you start, yeah, maybe doubting a bit more, but yeah, I, I guess it's survivorship bias as well. Like you, you see, it's always like that. It's the same thing as with, with startups. Like it, you, it seems to be like the situation is like, oh, all of these startups, like my friend started a startup and it, it's now like raising $50 million. Like, so it's basically survivorship bias is very strong. We need to kind of try and intellectually uh, calibrate our brains to, to that we, we, we have this bias assumptions. Yeah, no, exactly. I agree. It's... I think it's quite difficult, but I think that's also probably one thing that makes you progress. If you think you're not good enough or if you think um, others are better, at, at least me, it pushes me to work even more, to try to get even better. So 
it's a good and a bad thing as well. Yeah, but uh, it can also break you. Yeah. Like yeah. it's it's always that tension. Like like if you're comparing yourself too much with other people, they can that can motivate you. But you always feel that moment like okay, this can break me as well. Like and so not everybody everyone's character is the same, and so someone may very well give up because of that type of, of competition. So sometimes it's better to just re- like maybe uh, focus on yourself and, and, and focus on the process, not think about other people, not think even about like long-term goals. Just think about, okay, I have like five tasks I want to finish now, today and I'm going to go and grind and, and finish those tasks and just think about the process and less about the goals. And that, that can be kind of grounding and, and, and get you into the mood to, to, and set you for success basically. Yeah, that's super important, I think, to not... I think a lot of us are really focusing on the goals, like, oh, let's take a very bad, well, simple example. I post on LinkedIn and I will directly look at the likes and things like that. And if I don't have enough likes, I would say, oh, it's bad, I should stop. But actually, if you continue to post on LinkedIn, continue to work more, work more, you will actually... The process is good and what you're doing is actually going to end up being good in the long term. But if you focus on short-term outcomes, you can get demotivated very quickly. Yeah, that's true. But even that does not guarantee you a success. Like I know many people who've been persistent and 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 like posting to LinkedIn and still they have like they don't have as much as much likes or what whatever reactions as, mm-hmm. as they would like to. So it's also thinking about whom you're communicating to, who who is your target audience. Uh, being aware of what's the cap for that audience. Like if you're, I don't know, if you're going into too much technical details on LinkedIn or or mm-hmm. like you probably will not get like as big of a reach. Although I did have like paper, like my paper overview posts on LinkedIn are fairly popular because I guess that's because I already have like fairly research uh, like type of a community okay. yeah. around, yeah, on my LinkedIn. Yeah, no, so I agree. The pros, well, you need to, keep up and you don't need to abandon too quickly but you also need to improve and if you keep doing things you keep a bad process you'll never get any results yeah and if you really want it if you want if you if if your goal is to optimize the reach and to optimize the engagement from your audience and you're pushing in you're putting in the the effort you're putting in the time you're being consistent it's gonna come but most people don't even have that goal in mind like they kind of okay it'd be cool for me to have like big audience but like they are not really focusing and trying to think what's working what other people are doing and maybe like doing something creative like at the end you always combine other people's stuff and and then you find something yours and then you combine and create something that's going to work all right so just want to go back to software engineering at microsoft Um, we went on some kind of tangent that was quite interesting but yeah let's go back to that and how did you get the job what did you do there um yeah how let's talk about microsoft Okay, how that story started was basically, uh, in a way, it was serendipitous because, like, I found out about this machine learning summer camp uh, that was coincidentally organized by Microsoft people, and I don't really remember how I found out about it, but I know the the deadline was very close, so I found out about it. I don't know, like maybe February twenty fifth, and five days later, uh, the, the deadline was already there, and so I had kind of some luck to to find out about that thing. And then I, I passed some selection process, which lasted, I think, two or three days. And that's what I must say, like, that's one of the best selection processes I've been uh, through. Because usually when you apply for a tech company, you have a couple of very short algorithmic problems, like maybe one hour like long or 45 minutes. Here you had literally two, three days and open-ended problems. And so that was very cool. Although it's kind of hard to for them to, to, to know that you're not like uh, copy-pasting from someone. There are some software tools they're using in the background, but still, it's not that robust. But for me, it was very like very cool experience. And so, yeah, basically uh, that uh, led me to to like I was accepted uh, and I managed to to participate in that summer camp. And um, so, yeah, during that period, I was I was applying for Microsoft. And, and so what happened? I, I I ultimately went to this another student internship in in Brazil. And so what happened was very funny. Like six days in. I, I landed in Brazil, like I was like, yeah, like half the world, travel half the world to get there. And Microsoft HR calls me and I'm like, okay, is this really happening? Like six day in. And uh, and she was, uh, okay, you you, you you landed this, we, we, we have an offer for you. Uh, it's in this hall and steam, mixed reality, artificial intelligence, very cool. I was like, oh my God. And she was like, okay, but we need you here in a month. 
and my, my internship was supposed to be like three months. So I, so I came there, I think August, and then I, I was supposed to stay there like three months. And at the end, I, I returned back like mid of, of September. I kind of negotiated a bit more time, but like I couldn't really push it too far away. And, and so, yeah, so, so basically I, I stopped my internship. Luckily it was fairly flexible because uh, it was more of a, this student type of internship. I was uh, at this, uh, like a Brazilian university uh, with some professor and it was fairly relaxed. The professor was understanding and he was like, go for it. And, and so, yeah, I, I got back to Belgrade to, to, to Serbia and we have a fairly big like development center there. Like I think now maybe 350 full-time employer employees. And, and so, yeah, I started working there. And so what, what did you do there exactly? You mentioned you were in some kind of AI team, but you were still doing software engineering when, when you started, right? Yeah, that's true. So, so officially I, I, I got the role, like my role was a pure software engineering role. So I, I passed all of those algorithms and data structure, classical, your classical like interviews. Uh, I landed the job there. And because of the nature of, of that job, because I was working with this device called Holland, so we were, that's now public information, so I, can, so I can tell you some stuff there. Basically, I was working on this Holland 2 device, uh, specifically on the eye tracking uh, module. So basically understanding where the users are looking at, trying to figure out the, the, the gaze vectors and thus enable them to instinctually interact with, with, with holograms. And as soon as you start working with like 3D vision and vision in general, like computer vision, then you necessarily need to go into machine learning because it's like, like nowadays, like pretty much everything is either pure deep learning systems or some hybrid approaches. Like, uh, and um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I started there. So can you tell me a bit more about the project? Like, what what was, for example, one project that you worked on, and kind of the intersection between your job and the job of the machine learning engineer or the data scientist? I guess you would collaborate yeah, yeah. with them at some point, but. Yeah, I mean, roles roles are very, like, the nature of our job is continuous. And we artificially try and categorize those and break them down into discrete categories. And the, 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 the unfortunate fact is that, like, there is a lot of overloading and there is a lot of, like, one, one, one thing, like, saying you're a machine learning engineer gives me zero shenanigans. Like, it's literally zero information. Like, it can be anything from, from data engineering, like, doing something around data, like, like writing pre-processing transformations of data, or you can be writing actual models, or you can be just doing software engineering in, in the machine learning context. Like there is so many things, or you can be doing ML ops, even though they call you ML engineer. So the whole space is a mess because people, we, we yeah. haven't agreed on the, on, the, on the actual, we are not that strict with terminology. And so that's kind of mess. Uh, so getting back some, to your... <laughs> some information, right? You, you know, I'm not cooking pizzas, for example. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> I, I, I was obviously like just, yeah, yeah, yeah or, no, or I, exaggerating I, a bit, but but yeah, that's, that's uh, basically. I understand what you say. That that's yeah, that makes sense. And and so basically, what I was working on initially was, as I said, eye tracking. Uh, and uh, so my project was about detecting uh, glares on on your glasses. So that's a cool thing about Hololens. Uh, basically, Hololens supports uh, like uh, glasses. So you, as a user, don't have to put off your your glasses and then use the device, which which con which I think is the only device. I may be wrong now, but like I, I think Magic Leap and other uh, competitors did not have this this feature. And so I was basically working on this this uh, differentiating feature on on the Hololens device, which was fairly cool. Uh, and yeah, the goal was basically this. So you, you have this holographic device and you have, I'm not gonna get into too much like technical mm -hmm. details, just some high level stuff. Basically you have these uh, infrared uh, LED diodes and they basically reflect uh, uh, like from your glasses. And by just kind of looking at the patterns that, that those uh, LEDs uh, cause on your, like produce on your, on your glasses, you can develop certain detectors to, to understand how many glares there are, how big are the glares, and then you can create some logic and, and basically threshold the logic and say, hey, this user has a glasses or, or does not have a glasses, like ba basically binary classification uh, task. And yeah, there, there was a lot of accompanying things I had to do as, uh, like during that, that task. Like, uh, and that was a fairly long, when I say task, it's more of a like project. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, I had to uh, write down from scratch various visualization tools, um, which got noticed immediately. So, so my manager kind of noticed I have this like skill for visualiz visualizing stuff and, and interest in machine learning. And uh, aside from that, I, I had to like, I don't know, like writing some verification scripts for like labelers because we, we had like an in-house labeling team with whom I could like com communicate on a daily basis. 
And sometimes I have collected the data as well. So it, as I said, it was very, very various roles that I had. Like I was literally going from colleague to colleague, putting the device in their head, telling them what to do, collecting some data, then bringing the data back to my computer, analyzing the data, processing the data, writing algorithms, like everything. And at the end, we even have telemetry. So I was doing the, the whole stack at one point of time. So, and I was, and, and, and I was a software engineer back then. So there was, there was a software engineering role. So it's kind of wicked. Like it's, yeah. So, yeah. You're basically what we call today a machine learning in general, in, in some sense, right? You're mostly doing machine learning, maybe well, um, the actual algorithm detector was not, that's why I was not yet machine learning engineer. I was a software engineer because the, 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 that detector was more heuristics based, uh, classical yeah. uh, computer vision stuff. And, and, and yeah, it was not like a neural network actually. Okay. But still all the other process was the same. You need to collect data, visualize your data, label it, um, you build an algorithm and then yep. you make sure your algorithm works. So it's kind of the same process. Uh, in some sense exactly and you analyze some results so, so you're in a way also a data scientist i guess mm -hmm. I, I don't know depends how you how you define it but like data analyst so yeah and so is it at microsoft that you actually realize okay i really like ai and i want to learn more about this field like how does this happen this transition from software engineering to ai and machine learning yeah, it happened during the machine learning summer camp. Actually, that's that's when I when I kind of got uh, like interested in machine learning, and that was my first exposure. That was 2018. So I'm I'm yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm I, I've been here for like what's 2022. That's maybe four or five years. Not not that much for for like uh, for many people like who've been there for like a decade or more. Um, so yeah. And Sorry, so what, what was your what was your actual question? Mm -hmm. How did you transition from software engineering to AI and when did you start learning more about AI basically? Okay, so as I said, during that camp, I had this Rubik's Cube uh, like project that I developed. Uh, and again, it was mostly reusing something that some, somebody already posted to GitHub. We had some tweaking, so it, it wasn't really a, like a, something we did. We found this algorithm called DeepCube. And back then, I think it was Soda approach, like deep learning approach to solving Rubik's Cube. And so that was my first project, first exposure to ML. And, and then the, during that summer camp, we had um, basically presenters coming from, from DeepMind, from, from Cambridge, from all around the world, world-class experts. And that kind of got me this whole vibe around machine learning and exciting projects and exciting problems that we can tackle with machine learning, as well as people. Uh, got me got me excited about ML, and I was also very I, I, I like visual stuff. I, I I like seeing the results of my of my coding. So I, I don't get a kick from sorting an array. Like some people do. Like some people enjoy. Okay, I'm gonna implement merge sort or quick sort, and I input like like one million elements in an array, and wow, look, this is now 0 0.5 seconds instead of 1.5 seconds. No, for me, I, I, don't, I don't get a kick from that. Some people do. Some people are very excited optimizing stuff. For me, like I knew I, that there was a necessary evil. I had to learn that. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was much more enjoyable to understand, like uh, to analyze images, to analyze videos uh, and, and do stuff like that. So basically my love maybe even started during my faculty when I was doing this digital image processing course. And that kind of got me into ML camp. And then from ML camp, I got into Microsoft. And then there, because of the nature of my job, I slowly started transitioning into, into machine learning. Okay, that makes sense. And so what you enjoy the most about AI and machine learning is analyzing the data. Is that what you prefer rather than training a model and seeing your model perform well or making crazy predictions? that work yeah. really well uh, i wouldn't say that's the case like i have very broad broad interest in machine learning like very like when i say broad like i, ca I can't uh, overestimate how broad it is like i'm literally currently not just doing uh M like so 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 let me start like this maybe like in 2020 i, I started doing very i started analyzing various uh machine learning subfields and so i was I was uh, learning about computer vision and natural language processing and graph ML and reinforcement learning. So I was all around the place. And nowadays I, I even like, I started like uh, doing some, some courses on biology. So uh, biochemistry and genetics and genomics and cellular and developmental biology and neuroscience. So I'm all around the place. And it, the, the, the trick is I, I try not to spread myself too thin, mm -hmm. which may sound impossible, like, because 
all of these, every single word I said there, you can do a PhD, you can, you can like basically dedicate your whole life. But I think we need to have this fusion and, and the, the current academy and the current economy is not incentivizing you to make, to be this Renaissance type of like learning uh, person. And that's something I, I, I'm passionate about. And that's why, like, I think all of those, what connects all of those fields is that they kind of contribute to my understanding of intelligence. That's the, that's the connecting component. So I'm, so I'm basically curious about understanding intelligence and everything else comes from that. So that means I do enjoy training models. Uh, I do enjoy analyzing data. Uh, and I also ju enjoy just following what's going on in, in the whole community, just following the news, uh, all of that. So I wouldn't say I have like a single thing. I just, I'm just passionate about learning whatever I need in order to better understand how this intelligence of ours works or intelligence in general, even animal intelligence is fairly uh, interesting. We can get into that if you want, like, yeah. Okay, so, so you're, what is, what is intelligence for you? Like, how do you, how do you think about it? Maybe it's a difficult question. Yeah, starting yeah, with a simple let's... question. This is, a... <laughs> what is intelligence? Well, I can tell you at least, like, at least some of the papers I read, like, there's multiple papers. People people have been trying to define this since, I don't know, like the field itself started when, 50s, 60s with Turing maybe. And, and so like a couple of fa famous papers, uh, one of them is from Shane Legg and Marcus Hutter. They trying to define intelligence as uh, basically an agent that's uh, performant across various different tasks. So basically you have like this, they, they literally formalized intelligence by creating this sum they have some over tasks and they're trying to, so now we, we're getting into this Kolmogorov complexity and stuff, but like basically some, some notion of performance across an infinite amount of tasks. And that's their definition. And that's super nice mathematically, but like practically it doesn't make any sense. And also it's questionable whether that's intelligence because as later, like one of the Francois Cholet's papers on the measure of intelligence shows, basically you also need to, to take care of how much, how much like, training data did you have how much experience did you go through like if, if you can do something few shot or, or zero shot that's not the same thing as just doing fine tuning on that particular data domain or even training the whole model from scratch on that particular domain and then having high performance there so yeah i basically said other people's definitions of intelligence for me it's some interpolation between all of those i think we're all saying the same things we we don't know how to exactly formalize it like you know it when you see it but you don't really know how to how to define like a formal equation and then like maximize the objective function. Like it's like you you want to be adaptive. You want to be able to uh, with as little experience as possible to become performant at a task that you've never seen before. That would be like really like out of distribution type of uh, quick adjustment to, to to a problem. That would be intelligence. Some some yeah intelligence definition I guess. And so your goal is to understand it better. To, is there something else in mind? Like, I don't know, do you want to create a general, well, general artificial intelligent agent or whatever? What Do you have a particular goal in mind or you're just, you're just passionate about the topic and just want to learn, learn more about it? Yeah, so, so yeah, let me preface this by saying everything I say here is my personal opinion. So basically, and not that of my company. So I work for DeepMind and, and obviously our mission is to, to, to solve artificial general intelligence. So yeah, we, we basically, all of us think how to, to make that happen uh, during our daily job. And uh, I think most people are aligned on, on that same mission. Cool. So just to recap what we've already talked about, you did your bachelor in electronics in Belgrade, then you moved to software engineering you worked at Microsoft, and then at some point, you slightly touch on this, but I want to focus on that now. You actually decide to learn some subfields of AI on your own, uh, which is basically, you're basically doing a master or a bachelor, but on your own, um, learning bit by bit. So I'm interested in this process. Do you want to talk a bit more about this? Like, when do you realize, okay, I want to learn more about AI, and then how do you set up your plan um, and how did you learn about those subfields? Because from what I understand, you you had some experience in machine learning via this bootcamp, but you were not an expert. So that's how you kind of really got into the field, if that's right. Yep, that's correct. That's 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 like completely correct. So uh, I would say so. So the summer camp was in summer 2018, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I started working in Microsoft September uh, 2018. And uh, like, I think al al already after a month working uh, at Microsoft, because as I said, we were exposed to machine learning, even though I personally was working more with classical computer science, uh, computer vision algorithms. So I started doing Coursera courses. So classics mm -hmm. like Andrew Ang, uh, I, I went through the whole, uh, basically first the, the general machine learning course, and then through all of the deep learning specializations, we, of, of which there are five of them. And then step by step, uh, I, I was like, that was my first big step, I would say. And uh, I started, I, I, I was involved internally in organizing this very same machine learning summer camp. So I now started preparing the tasks, uh, started uh, going, like doing everything that's like organizational and then thinking about um, like uh, preparing the tasks and then doing the selection process and, and all of that. And so because I was engaged internally, um, then, then, then we also organized this, this internal hackathon, machine learning hackathon. And as a part of that hackathon, I created one of probably one of my coolest projects, to be honest, like what I've done is I, I, I basically trained this, this Keras, uh, CNN, mm -hmm. so a, a convolutional neural network in Keras. And the goal was to uh, detect gestures. And so what I've done, I first uh, trained it to, to, to understand like swipe left, swipe right, uh, and then thumbs up, thumbs down, gestures cool. such as that. And then what I've done during the hackathon, I connected that with PowerPoint. So I, I, I don't even remember how anymore, but it was very hacky. Like it's, it was amazingly hacky. Basically I, I had two separate processes. I was running like in Python, like the CNN was running in the background. Then I had a different process like, um, uh, like in, in, in C sharp. And basically uh, what I was doing is I was, I was logging uh, some information via, via file system. So I was basically creating new files for every bit of information because that was the hacky way to do it. And then the other process was kind of reading those files and, and like, it was a mess, but at the end it worked perfectly. That was, that was, that's beautiful. Like I managed to, to, to get it working during the hackathon and actually during my presentation, during my public presentation, I was using, so the background, the computer uh, was running that, that very uh, same program in the background. And I was, once my presentation, uh, uh, yeah, was, was uh, due, I, I started using it and just changing slides and everybody was like, okay, this is very cool. He actually developed a project and was using it for, for the presentation. Now, the, 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 the funny part I forgot to mention is that I think I crashed someone's presentation before that and nobody knew what's going on. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was just nervously smiling in the background and I was like, eh. Everything is fine. <laughs> it's, so, so that you developed that within a couple of days, right? So the ML side, I started doing much before Hackathon, like much, I mean, maybe two weeks I was working okay. on that project, made it very solid and stuff. And then during the Hackathon, I, I, I made it more of a plugin for a PowerPoint. Okay, cool. And so this part was during during while you were at microsoft or be before microsoft yeah, yeah this was this was all during my my job at microsoft so this was uh, late 2018 was coursera and that's when i started working at microsoft and also early 2019 was this this uh, this hackathon i mentioned and then the whole of 2019 was mostly me learning other stuff to be honest i was working at microsoft i was here and there i was maybe reading a couple of papers because of the summer camp but like nothing much, to be honest. I was mostly focusing on learning software engineering as well, like just getting like, un like understanding of the internal projects I was working on. And aside in my free time, I was learning about actually about finance. I was reading about like entrepreneurship, various books on various topics that interest me uh, deeply. And so that was 2019, basically yeah. not much ML. And then 2020 came uh, and then I was like, turbo boost like i just started learning like like crazy pandemic helped a lot so it was again some some uh component of luck uh and uh, yeah we can now if you want i can i can get into how i structured this whole like 2020 and 2021 i can yeah 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 that would be interesting i just just a quick question before that were you still at microsoft because when you talk about this it looks like you didn't have i was and during, this whole time, just... during, during this whole time, I was in Microsoft all, all, all uh, until, well, last summer, basically 2021, yeah. summer 2021. I, I was working constantly in Microsoft and I was just like, the thing is, I'm like, I, I, I when I want to do something, I, I just invest a lot of my time into it. And sometimes other things have to, to you have to sacrifice something. Obviously you can't do everything, but I was, I was, I think what I didn't, didn't sacrifice that much was socialization. I always try to focus on things that matter. And so I, I just didn't do Netflix. I didn't do like go, go and chill and drink beer for two hours or just like, I always try to do something that's productive or, or be with people because those things are something that that's for me a priority. And 
if I have enough time, then I can do other stuff, but I usually don't. Okay, cool. So yeah, can you go to how you started learning? And that's yeah, super impressive already that yeah, you you look like you're really you stick to your plans, you have some plans and you really stick to them and you don't get distracted by a notification or by watching Netflix or by whatever, which no way, no way. I, I I literally feel bad and depressed if I if I if I start being unproductive. So so maybe I, I, I got my mind into this mindset where I feel depressed if I'm not progressing, if I'm not self advancing, if I'm not learning and and Maybe that's bad, maybe that's good, but I think many successful people actually have the trait. That's what I noticed. Like I didn't know that back then, but like if you take a look of like m many of those people, like take Elon Musk or, or Gary Vaynerchuk or who not, like those guys cannot like they, they have to do something. They they have to 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 be busy. And I guess after working for years and and spending a lot of time working, it's hard not to work and it's hard not to 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 do something that's uh, making you better or your company better or whatnot. Yeah, I, to be honest, I feel kind of the same. Like I always need to do something. I would never, even during weekends, I don't want to wake up late. I want to wake up early and still do things. And sometimes it could be hanging out with friends and enjoying the weekend, but it can also be reading a book or doing something. And every time I just do nothing, I would never watch Netflix or anything because, yeah, I don't know. I feel I'm losing time, but sometimes it can, this can also be stressful because you're kind of putting a lot of pressure on you. Like, oh, and no, I'm not productive. And I think it's also important to have some time where you're not doing anything and you just think about life, about things, because a lot of creativity and inspiration comes when you're bored. And if you're, you're never bored, it's, it gets kind of difficult. So I try to have some, always some time where I get bored to be productive, but yeah. That's completely true. And that's something I should be doing more of, to be honest. Like I'm, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about that uh, like over the last couple of months, to be honest. Like you have to find this trade off when you're learning and absorbing other people's information versus when do you have time to think for yourself. And I think more than ever, we are now like leaning towards this, this side of constantly learning something. You always have this new paper. You always have this new video, a new podcast coming out. And back then, like, I don't know, like 200 years ago, people didn't have Netflix nor internet. And so they could focus and think a lot. And so it's a delicate balance. Uh, when do you want to learn more? versus when do you want to just take the knowledge you have and try and produce something creative? Uh, yeah, I mean, I obviously make breaks, like I do power naps, I do like uh, strolls, I train, and during that period, uh, or when you're just taking a shower, uh, all of those periods are much more like those uh, divergent mode of thinking. And so that, that helps, but you, you need to dedicate, I think, some time during your day to just think, like just Go and chill. Go, go walk, and that—that's a note to myself, by the way. I'm, I'm just telling <laughs> that to myself right now because I'm not doing that not nearly enough. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes right. I literally spend like I don't know, like I, I really, like my my weekend is basically someone's work day. Like oftentimes, like I, I literally work sometimes like ten hours on, on 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 like Saturday and Sunday as well, and like like I would chill in the in the evening, but before that, the whole time I would just be doing something like reading like writing blogs or, or depending on whether I'm in the input or output mode, whether I'm just ingesting and learning or am I writing a blog or, or creating a, uh, like a project or making a YouTube video or whatnot. So can we go now to the part where you started learning about AI? Like how, yeah, how did you go through that process and how did you work? Uh, how did you learn so much on your own basically? Yeah, well, I started learning, as I said, in 2018. So it's not like, and I was also working yeah. constantly. Don't forget, like I'm, I'm, I'm making it sound like Microsoft was this like one hour thing. I was working eight hours there every day. So I was learning, I was learning a lot constantly. I was exposed to ML internally. I was constantly being exposed to all of this. And then uh, 2020 came and um, I basically decided to make the best use out of pandemic. So less distractions. I also didn't have to travel to my uh, work. And so I decided I want to, systematically start and learn uh, a lot about various different topics. And so the first topic I, I was I was very interested in was a neural style transfer, which if you know, know my background, you know that makes sense because it's again, very visual, uh, very like you, you write some program and all of a sudden nice pictures come out and that was very pleasing to me. And so I started with neural style transfer, and then, so my idea was to basically uh, dedicate two to three months of my time to each of the subfields I, I, I'll, I approach. 
and uh, and I also try to to structure that I, I call that my macro cycle, and then I try to to structure those macro cycles into micro cycles, and each of those micro cycles are of two types, basically either input or output. So input is when I'm learning, I'm ingesting information, I'm reading blogs, I'm I'm watching like videos, so high level information, and then slowly starting and reading papers, and then I have the output uh, micro cycle where I'm being in the output mode, obviously. So I'm trying to regurgitate the knowledge I accumulated either through a video or, or uh, I also try and uh, basically implement from scratch uh, that, that like some, some of the representative algorithms from, from that uh, particular subfield. So I usually do that uh, like in the middle. That, that was my rough structure. Like in the middle, I would do this, this, uh, this uh, coding for maybe, I think on average it was 10 to 15 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the end of the macro cycle, what I would do is I would summarize everything I learned uh, all of the resources, all of the videos, everything I went through, at least the interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I would curate all of that into, into a blog, which is literally like, th that's a blog that uh, three month uh, younger Alexa would be grateful for. That's how I tried to, to write those. And I, I just noticed that people in the community found a lot of uh, those, uh, that content very useful. So I'm, I'm super, super pleased to hear that. So, so yeah, that was, that was a rough structure and um, I can get into more details if you want, like um, I don't want to hijack that. Yeah, I would be interested to know how you managed to yeah, learn one topic in more details. Yeah, feel free to, to go for it. And also how, what, what are the different topics that you learn? You mentioned neural style mm -hmm. transfer, uh, yeah. What? Yeah, basically started with neural style transfer and then uh, I, was, I was then uh, learning about deep dream, which is this, very psychedelic like looking you can maybe even post a picture here on the on the screen or something uh like algorithm again very visual and then uh, i did gans so generative adversarial networks uh, and after that i i started uh, learning more about nlp so natural language processing i, I implemented the transformer model there the original transformer uh and then graph ml and at, at the end reinforcement learning so all of that was uh, throughout the period of uh, early 2020 through like maybe March, April, 2021. That was the like one year and four months was roughly that high intensive various areas. But then I did not stop. Like you, Since then I, I continued with the same pace. I'm just doing, I just shifted my, my, my focus onto different things. And so during this time, you just tell to yourself, okay, I'm only, let's say you're only doing one topic. You, you just tell to yourself, I'm only going to, do this topic and nothing else. Um, exactly. No articles on RL while you are nope. learning GANs. Like just focusing on a single topic. Exactly. Complete focus. Like I, I would literally close. I, I, back then I didn't even use Twitter, so I, Twitter came much later for me. I, I actually I think uh, uh, um, late twenty twenty was when I created my Twitter. So that was like almost nine ten months in to that whole program. So I didn't have any distractions. I was like. Uh, I just want to, I start basically by a Google, it starts with a Google query. Like you will start transferring, find some blogs, they start the filtering, uh, accumulating filtering information. I'm always, I have this, this uh, uh, top-down approach. And so that's how I start learning. And I was, I was trying just to, to read everything on, only on that particular area and try and not, not uh, diverge too much into, into anything else. So I was just reading papers uh, chronologically from, from that field and uh, super focused, to, to be honest. One maybe more precise question, but that could be useful for anyone who wants to get into the field. Like, how do you find the resources that you're going to then read or watch to learn about the field? Because there are so many things on GANs or on NLP. So how do you decide, okay, I'm actually going to do this course and read this paper and nothing else? Yeah. Uh, so first, I guess, very important uh, advice is not to get into this decision-making paralysis. Just find something that the community already says is decent like resource and go for it. Like don't try and create an optimal path because you'll just get exhausted and you'll probably give up. Uh, so how I do it, having said that, uh, is, as I said, I just do a query and maybe I, I, I append like medium and I go through 
various medium articles. I just I look at various metrics. I see how the person is writing. Where like just by like just by eyeballing an article, you can see whether somebody like doesn't know how to write. If a person who is a researcher or or an engineer, they usually know how to structure their text because at least like if they're researchers, then they're writing papers, so they definitely know how to structure text. And so that's that's a very like easy thing to discard like low quality material. Also. If there is a lot of like likes, maybe maybe there can be an additional signal. Although you, you you need like you take you have to be very very cautious about about the popularity mm -hmm. metrics, um, and yeah, I basically open up this this OneNote program. So I, I'm on Windows and uh, I just accumulate uh, blogs and then I filter them. I do the same thing for, for videos and then I start reading. And as I'm reading, I'm again now it's it's very nonlinear process. I find something that's interesting. I open up the link. And if it's very interesting, I just put it to my backlog or now it's very hard to, to describe the exact process because sometimes I, yeah. I just kind of go into that loophole and sometimes I just put it on my backlog on my stack and I don't think about it and I just continue reading the blog. So yeah, slowly I start accumulating high level resources and then once I'm comfortable with the skeleton of knowledge, once I understand how this field is structured, I just go and uh, search for most seminal papers from, from that particular field. So I always know one one paper that's like very famous. Mm -hmm. Like for, for neural style transfer, there will be like, uh, well, basically the neural style transfer algorithm by Gatiss et al. And so I started with that one and then I saw what it was referencing. And usually if you see that you need, if you see that it's um, leveraging too much the knowledge from one of those previous uh, like uh, papers, then I, I kind of digress and I, I read those previous papers and then I read the actual paper and then and then you see the other, the other references and then I mean it's just exploration and you basically again I, I, I can accumulate a bunch of papers I usually sort in chronologically because that's that's like how the causal dependencies look like and uh, I start reading them one by one and sometimes multiple times and sometimes I cover a video just to, to get additional like uh, understanding and force myself to, to really understand and explain to others. So and that's a rough process. And implement things on your own as well to to make sure you you really understand. Yeah, but that usually comes after I've already read like 15, yeah. 20 people. Like yeah. I, I'm already kind of feeling like comfortable understanding what what's going on in this in this subfield, and then and then I, I start uh, implementing some some project. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's super cool actually, um, and quite impressive. Um, that's I think super also detailed and super like you really go deep into one field. If we go more from the beginning, like what would be your advice for someone who wants to get started in the field? Like what would you recommend them to do to get started in AI and machine learning? Well, I literally made a blog on the topic. So like I can, yeah. I can, I can do a TLDR here. And, yeah, like I, and, I recommend, and I can link the post. Uh, I will link, to the, link post the, the Yeah, feel free to link the post if you want. Uh, basically the blog. Uh, so. As I said, there is so many courses nowadays. Everybody, everybody wants to make their own course, and there, most of those courses are just people trying to earn some money, and and that's also fine. Uh, but like, you, you, literally, your top two like uh, options probably uh, will be Coursera. So Andrew Eng, those are like I think most ML people you'll see nowadays went through that course that's like a og yeah. course for machine learning the second one which that's very uh, cool is from uh, jeremy howard so fast ai uh he has i think two courses one is uh like more beginner friendly the other one is much more advanced uh and you can kind of do them uh one after the other so i would say go with one of those two you will not make a mistake either way the whole point of the first initial course is just to get you exposed to the terminology to the people out there so you know who are the experts in which particular area, you know some terminology, you know what's a backprop, you know what's a neural network, what's a CNN, what's an RNN, just like those basic concepts. And I think any one of those two will, will work. And then, then work your way uh, like for, from there. Like, yeah, focus maybe on, on, on doing more practical work. I think that's what's missing for most people. And Jeremy Howard, the, the uh, like basically founder of SDAI is very bullish on, on telling people to, uh, create practical projects and just code something. You'll understand much better. You'll have to debug stuff. You'll you'll understand that there are many details you were not aware of while reading the paper. So as they say, devil is in the detail. Yeah, I agree that doing a project, you also just learn so much more when you when you actually implement the project. You can take ten courses and it will always be very theoretical and things like that. But when you actually do a project, you get your hands dirty. You implement something. 
you will learn so much. And it, I also feel it sticks in your head. Once you've implemented it, you can remember it. Whereas if you just read or watch, I don't know, 10 courses, you will forget at some point if you don't practice. 100%. 100%. Like, that's why I always had these, uh, like, input-output type of, of, of structure. And um, I forgot to mention one, one course that shaped my thinking a lot and helped me with this better structuring of my learning, of my curriculum, is uh, Coursera's Learning How to Learn course. Uh, I think there are two teachers. One is Barbara. The other teacher is uh, Terry Sainovsky. Hopefully, I'm not butchering his, his name. He's a very famous guy in the neuroscience uh, community. And so super recommend that course to anyone because uh, like taking a step back and turbo boosting your learning capabilities and learning some tips is much better. So you investing two months of your time or even less, I don't think you need more than a month for that course. And then doing something for 12 months, you're going to accomplish so much more than somebody who started and was one month in front of you, but mm -hmm. then like just had like much less optimal learning strategy and uh so yeah strongly recommend that one okay cool i will yeah definitely check it out and we'll also link it on the description um so yeah we've talked about about a lot about how you learned about ai so let's now move to deep minds um, at some point you actually have deep mind in your head you want to get the job there so yeah how does this process work and how do you manage to get a, an offer at deep mind Okay, so basically the, 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 the deep mind idea was planted in my brain already in 2018 during that summer camp I mentioned. So I had, as I said, we had lectures from deep mind and this whole, their appearance was like very, very, very powerful. I don't know, like the, I heard all of these rumors, like people who, who, who work there, all, all, all of them are from prestigious faculties, uh, like they, they, they come from like Stanford, MIT, Oxford, Cambridge. They have like this, like most of them have PhDs and it was kind of sounded like very academic and very like intellectual uh, company to be, to be in. And so there was this allure uh, from the, from the very, get, from the get go. And uh, then, yeah, th this whole journey of mine uh, was happening. Uh, I was working Microsoft. I was not thinking about DeepMind that much. And then like it roughly, I would say aligned like with my, 2020 journey so when i started doing this neural style transfer and all these projects and i think maybe middle of that year i i, I figured out okay maybe maybe i could give it a shot like maybe I, I don't exactly remember when was this when did this crazy idea like when did it pop uh, like in my mind and when did i feel so confident that hey i, I can kind of land a job there because before that it sounded like very incredible and impossible so i'm not sure when the exact moment happened and um, yeah, then I was just learning, 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 and I tried to connect with some people from DeepMind. So, so, so I knew this guy, Petr Belichkovic, who is a, a, and a shout out for Petr if he's listening to this. Uh, basically, he's an expert in his field, uh, GraphML, and uh, I, I started chatting with him on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't remember how. And uh, basically, I told him, hey, in a couple of months, I'll probably start uh, covering some GraphML papers. Uh, I want to cover your paper. And uh, if you if you have some time, uh, I would love to chat with you just to if you can help me around to understand better uh, all of this literature. And he was very receptive. He said yes. And um, and then December came. I started covering. I started reading papers, all of the input output stuff. And uh, then I, I made a video covering graph attention networks, where he was the first author. And that's I think the second highest, the, the, the second most cited paper in the GraphML community. And uh, yeah, then I, I implemented this graph attention network uh, like paper, which blew up like that, that. That project just blew up beyond my imagination. It was like now I think it has over 1,600 stars, which oh. is like for for individual contributor who has done that in a couple of weeks in his free time. I was literally working full time back then in Microsoft. Like it just exploded, and the whole community found it useful. Apparently, that there were only uh, not that high quality research type of implementations in, in TensorFlow and people needed one in, in PyTorch and I just filled in that gap and that kind of blew up. And again, I think that's one of the things that also helped me uh, make that better uh, bond between mm -hmm. like Petra and me and establish that like communication channel even even firmer. And yeah, then he he was very, very happy to, to refer me for, for DeepMind. Uh, that's what he, he told me and then the, the rest is history. <laughs> 
<laughs> so when we chatted, you mentioned you actually wasn't didn't get the job at first, and then you got it in the end. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. That's correct. And basically, all of that happened very fast. So um, I just went through a bunch of interviews. I, I was first thinking whether I should go into this part of the org or, or the other part of the org. And uh, I started, I decided for one, but it was fairly arbitrary, to be honest. Like, I, until you see the actual projects and the actual people, you don't really know. So I'm, I'm very experimental in that sense. Like, I, I, I want to A-B test. I want to try both roles and test, but like, that doesn't work like that. And so I just arbitrarily picked one because most of my friends, so Petra was in that part of the org, and so I, I applied for that one. And I basically passed all of the interviews. And um, in the last one, so what happened, so I can maybe... Yeah, I don't know how, how much I, I, I can I can tell here. Uh, sorry about that. But um, basically, uh, m my understanding was that it was, it was more of a noise type of a thing than me not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. And it was more, uh, okay, like, I don't align with the type of, of profile for that particular team. So it was, again, more of a cultural thing, cultural, not being a cultural fit for that particular uh, team. And then because I was like a, like a strong technical, like a technical candidate, they rerouted me into this other uh, part of the org. And then four or five interviews later, uh, that team accepted me. So it was basically like, like it's just the other team. And, and, and sometimes you, you don't get the exact team you want. And yeah. So you started this job a few, a few months ago, right? You came to London quite recently. Mm -hmm. in, in, which, in which team are you now? What are you working on exactly? Do you want to go into just a bit yeah. more details what's what's the team and what are you focusing on sure so so i currently work in this team it's, it's called the applied team and uh basically we 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 try and take the research from from deep mind and we try and create some some cool projects some cool products uh like and and then if if it's if it makes sense if it's if, if it looks reasonable then then we basically uh, pass it on to 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 Google and or, or, for example or, or or we just in general we try we try to productionize uh, like research that's coming from DeepMind doesn't have to necessarily be Google or Alphabet uh, it can be uh, just something that that we find uh, like useful for for the world and and now uh, uh, when I say applied this can be misleading so I have to elaborate a bit more mm -hmm. so DeepMind has very collaborative culture and so this whole team label is very loose because I collaborate on a daily basis with, with like researchers, con I co constantly collaborate with researchers. And sometimes you're doing the stuff that researchers are doing. Sometimes you're doing engineering stuff. So it's very, again, it's very um, vague and it depends on your particular role. Depends how long you've been in the company. Depends on a bunch of factors. It depends on the particular phase of the project, the, the, the project you're in. So you, you cannot define it. So yeah. Basically, it's a bit more uh, geared towards being up, like applied uh, compared to being in this other part where it's a bit more geared towards research. So you're trying to publish a paper. Maybe that's like your final uh, goal. Whereas for us, it's maybe building something that's uh, that's going to be uh, useful for the external world. Okay, so if I understand correctly, and yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not starting from scratch. You're already taking some project that already exists within DeepMind, and you're just kind of improving it or developing it further to make it useful in the real world, as you mentioned, or can you also start completely from scratch? Like, oh, let's build this, this project from scratch because it looks cool. Mm, depends. We also have some, so inside of applied, we also have people who do more of a research. And so sometimes it can be from scratch. Sometimes it can be uh, reusing something existent there. And then maybe Additionally, like uh, experimenting with it, combining with some other mo models, and like yeah, it's it's complicated. Okay, so can can we talk about one? I I saw recently that you posted something on Famingo, so a visual language model algorithm. So can we talk about this one? I guess this comes from your team since you posted about it. Yeah, can you maybe first describe what is Flamingo? What was the problem that you were trying to solve? Why is it useful? Um, just a brief high-level overview. Mm -hmm. So uh, Flamingo is not from my team per se because it's not from the it's from the research side. But okay. we, as I as I said, we closely collaborate with with, with them. Mm -hmm. And so what Flamingo is for for those of you who don't know, it's a, a VLM. So it's a vision language model, which means 
uh, your, you can feed it uh, images, you can feed it videos, you can feed it text, and you can ask it questions. Or so, so, so it can answer questions, can, it can generate text. It's basically the, the, the only modality, the, the only output modality is text. So you can, for example, imagine uh, inputting an image and asking a question and you get an answer. Or you can input an image and the model captions the, uh, the image. Or you can input a video and then you can do whatever. Like you, or you can just combine multiple, you can kind of prompt it. So now you're, we're getting into the uh, like uh, prompt engineering into uh, this, in, I think it's in context learning. Hopefully I'm not butchering the word. Uh, basically, you, you kind of tell the model what you're trying to um, elucidate from it. So, so you give it uh, an image, you give it an example of the answer you're, you're expecting, and then you do that a couple of times uh, in a smart way. And then the model, you just Learns. prompt it finally with an image and it gives you whatever you're, you're trying to get from it. So that's, that's kind of high level uh, overview of, of, the, of the model. And so it can solve multiple tasks right that's like the what's the novelty there is it that it can yeah solve multiple tasks uh, yeah i would say um what's the novelty um i don't think that so far we we, we didn't have those types of uh like vlms where so models where you can uh, intersperse both the textual and 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 and, and vision and video modalities so i might be wrong here don't, don't quote me on this so everything i say is my personal opinion um, but basically, uh, the, 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 the scale, the scale, the engineering, the fact that we, we, I think some of parts of the data set were also collected internally, uh, and like all of that is, is, is like uh, a novelty, I would say, uh, I mean, yeah, if you, if you take a look at, at many of the models, there's a lot of similarities between that model and that model. Like it's, sometimes it's mostly about scale and maybe a couple of engineering details and maybe you do introduce some, some, uh, research novelty, but it's. With, with language models, it's mostly about free, like most of what engineering, maybe even, I don't know, like maybe that's that's a, a simplification, but uh, like engineering is definitely underappreciated. And I think people are starting to communicate that more and more uh, these days. So can we go a bit into like multitask learning? Like you basically, you train the algorithm on some collection of images and texts and then you test it on a bunch of tasks, right? And uh, how, do, how does this process work? Like how can an algorithm know, okay, no, I'm doing task A or doing task B. How does it know, how can he do multiple things at once? Basically what you do is you collect a lot of data and that data contains already some of those uh, tasks you're, 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 you, you care about. So for example, some of the documents may, may, may literally have question answer format or whatnot. And then what you do is you literally train the model to predict the next word. And by doing that, by this super simple language modeling objective, you get this emergent phenomenon, th these emergent skills where you can then show it an example and all of a sudden it can, it can, it can understand what, what you're trying to, to ask it for. And the model just starts auto completing. And so it's, it's, a bit of a magic, to be honest. I think I think everybody everybody was surprised once a GPT three came out, mm -hmm. and the the uh, language models are few shot learners. Uh, I think that's roughly the title, and yeah, it, it it seems that the scale was the the necessary component to get that qualitative difference in 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 behavior. So now that we see that an algorithm can do multiple tasks at once, do you think we are close to? general artificial intelligence, like having an agent as smart as a human that can, I don't know, um, clean dishes while playing football, while talking to someone, like, do you think we are close to this or what's your, is your work still super far away from general artificial intelligence? Whatever I say, I'm going to make a wrong predict prediction. <laughs> I, think, I, 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 th I think we're doomed to make wrong predictions. Uh, I mean, it's literally like if you try and make a prediction that's more than three years into the future, it's like if it's like an analogy with a car and a fog. And after that fog barrier comes like kicks in, you don't see anything. And, and so all of your predictions are off. So it might happen then like that already in five years time or 10 years time, this, the whole scaling and, and improving hardware and, and uh, the research we are doing uh, already helps us get to incredible uh, type of intelligence. 
but it may also well be that we are overestimating something here and then maybe we'll get into some saturation mode with, with our language model. So once we get to, I don't know, like trillion parameters, all of a sudden we see the saturation. Although all of the trends so far have showed that we don't see any type of saturation going on. So that's scary and that's very cool. So, yeah. The type of situation, what do you, what do you mean? So, I mean that as we are making these models bigger and bigger, we, okay. are, we are seeing progressively like better and better, like, like lower loss or or higher performance whatever your performance metric is okay yeah that's cool because it means more people it doesn't you don't need to be a super big lab to do this it's accessible to everyone everyone could well maybe not now but with a bit more computing power in the few year in a few years everyone could implement their own multitask learning model or whatever well i doubt that's gonna happen because we are already seeing the trend that some big companies open source the models. And then what you'll probably be doing is fine tuning or much more probably you'll be just prompt engineering. You're literally trying to elucidate the knowledge from, from, from that uh, model, from the foundation model, which is the, the new fancy term for, for transformers. So, yeah. Okay. So one last thing about this research and AI, and then we'll go to the last part, which is, some career advice that you might have is because you've read so many papers, you've looked at so many different subfields. Is there one algorithm or one research that really blew your mind? Like you were like, wow, AI can actually do this. That's, that's crazy. That's unexpected. If, if you had to think of one, what do you think? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, let me think a little bit about it. I, I, I honestly, I think a couple of these models that came out in the over the last four months had that effect on me. I did not expect many of the behaviors we are now seeing. Uh, like also recently, we 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 saw um, imagine be imagine. I think that's how you pronounce it. Model being published from 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 Google. We saw Dali two from OpenAI. We saw all of those models. Uh, they're doing the, the the text to to image generation. Mm -hmm. That's kind of fascinating. Flamingo was also amazing, uh, and I, I I'm becoming a believer. I, I, <laughs> like I'm not again. I'm not saying anything. I I I don't know when exactly we are gonna achieve uh, AGI. No idea, no idea. But like I'm being more and more optimistic about it. So the two papers that you mentioned, Dali and Imagen. Um, just to give a small explanation, you basically give it some kind of text and it produces a super high quality image, um, which is quite crazy. You can tell anything like two cobras on the beach wearing a hat and drinking coffee and you will actually have a super high quality image of this. Uh, I will link also the papers in the description, but it is. I agree with you that that's probably one of the craziest things I've seen, like an AI which can understand such a rich and complex language and output an image of this. That's yeah, super crazy. Yeah, and also also Flamingo, like just having the, this multimodal dialogue, mm -hmm. dialogue with an agent is amazing. Like being able to uh, like basically post a video or an image to a dialogue and expect an answer from, from the agent is also mind-boggling uh, yeah so can you basically chat with the agent and he would answer you like you're almost like a real person well i don't know if you saw the the, the post on twitter we, we i saw i saw i saw the, some... I saw the post yeah it's so, for, so for so, the followers i i, I yeah, yeah. I the... so again obviously we want to be like transparent and we we also showed limitations that, that we still have a lot of work to do like I, I i don't think any reasonable person in, in deep learning is arguing that we have a lot of work to do we're seeing some fascinating results but uh yeah a long way ahead mm -hmm. cool so let's now focus to well go on the last part of the conversation just a few career advice that you might have the first one is more looking back at your career, like you've already done a lot. Well, you're very young. You told me 27 when we chatted. You, this hasn't changed since a few weeks it ago. Hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, looking back at your career, what's like 
one big challenge that you faced or what's the biggest challenge that you faced something like yeah really crazy that you achieved so are you asking for the the, the biggest ch uh, challenge or or my, my my something i'm the most proud of as you want um okay so when it comes to challenge i i would say there is no discrete event that was the most challenging. I think it's the, the process. I think it's that sticking with the process and being stubborn, being uh, like very, very patient and, and being uh, doing your due diligence and working hard. I think that's the hardest problem, but the hardest challenge, just being consistent and always putting in the good work and know when to make a break so that you don't get into too many burnouts and like i think that's that's the hardest part like being not giving up and being persistent that's probably the the the, the biggest challenge what are some mistakes that you've made then in the past because yeah the process now seems to be good you're at deep mind which is already quite impressive so do you think about one big mistakes that you've made um in the past that's a good question uh I well, I wouldn't change anything because otherwise, who knows? Mm -hmm. But um, huh? It's also true the biggest mis the biggest mistakes that you actually learn a lot. I think someone said, "There, I never lose. I either win or I learn." Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean. What would I change? Is that what you're asking or? Oh, yeah, one big mistake or if you had to do something differently, yeah, what would you change? Maybe like, I, I would probably say start earlier, but then I would miss out on some other things. It's not like I was back then watching Netflix. I, I was always like, the, the thing I need to make explicit is that like before, even before my faculty, I was very like um, disciplined. It mm -hmm. all started for me with working out. So I was uh, literally sometimes like for a year, I think I had two workouts every day for a year. Like I, I had this crazy type of uh, discipline. I could, I could, I could just kind of do some, like decide to do something and I would be like very, very stubborn and very, very persistent at it. Uh, I also was like learning human languages. And I literally during my high school days, I learned roughly four, four languages on my own without like ever, ever attending a class or whatnot. Like, and again, it's not because I, I, I really honestly don't think I'm, I'm like too smart or intelligent. I think it's mostly to do with tenacity. These other, like, I think some of these other, we, we talk about IQ too much, but there is so many other traits which are super important because your IQ will never be, uh, what's the word, uh, expressed if you don't put in the effort, if you're not tenacious. So there are many skills you, you have to have to, to, to get where you, where you want. So, so yeah, I, I wouldn't change anything because then I would miss out on the, on, on the experience, like just getting to know my body, understanding nutrition better, uh, socializing, learning languages, traveling, all of that was some background, which I would not change. Obviously there are certainly there are more optimal paths, uh, but yeah, I think, I think it turned out to be a good thing. Okay, that makes sense. And so, one mistake you think then, if you wouldn't change anything, is there one mistake that you the mistake that you've made? Well, I, well, I make I make mistake on make mistakes on a, on a daily basis probably, but uh, I, I don't have any any like particular big big mistake. Which, like, yeah, I I the mis like what I would regret is that if if I haven't tried and applied multiple times and accepted the rejections and if I gave up, I think the only mistake you can make is giving up. And I did not give up. So I, that's why I don't think I, I had any, any big mistakes. Like literally the only big mistake is you giving up. And like, of course, you, you do have to have a target, which is reasonable now. <laughs> so yeah, makes sense. Um, so two questions before we actually finish the episode. The first one is, now that you're at DeepMind, you're working with some of the best researchers, machine learning engineers in the world. So What's a good data scientist, machine learning engineer, according to you? Whew. That's a tough one because there are multiple dimensions where you can excel and be considered a good, a great machine learning engineer. So what I mean by that is some people are like, 
literally very, very good technically. They are amazing technically. They are just like the best programmers out there. They they are very pedantic. They are very patient. They can dig into the logs and understand everything and be patient with debugging. But maybe they miss communication skills. They are not as good there. And maybe that's, I'm just giving two dimensions, possible mm -hmm. dimensions. There's multiple more. I'm just giving two to, to simplify stuff. And then maybe the other person is not as great when it comes to like being like technical expert in whatever like domain, but they are much better at collaborating. They're they're, they're the glue. They're they're the the, the the connecting person in that team and the, the person that maybe raises the spirit or or makes the makes the team feel like a team, feel like a cohesive unit. So I think it's the same thing with, as with brain. Like I wouldn't say any particular like cell in the brain is better than the other. Because like I'm not gonna get into neuroscience, but you roughly have this like glial cells and you have ne neural cells. So, so people usually think you only have ne neurons. You don't like neurons are the computational units, but glial cells provide the computational units with immunity, with nutrition, with like everything else, like with energy. And so, so some people are more like being like connecting, and, and some people are more are better at computing and, and doing stuff. So all of those. Mm -hmm. types of people are, are necessary to have like this functioning system uh such as team or a company and i'm just comparing it with another system which is brain i think it's a maybe adequate analogy i would say i think that's a good point like, you need a bit of everything to have a good team if you only have good uh, well people that are really really good technically but who cannot communicate or whatever then you don't have a good team if you only have people who are good at communicate uh, communication but cannot do the work technically yeah. then you also don't have a good team so what you're saying is to have a good team of data scientists you need a bit of everything and exactly uh, exactly the, so, so like i mean if you want a good team you need to have complementary skills you, you need to, to to be like like a cohesive unit yeah no i mean i think that that makes sense and yeah usually i think also some people can think, I actually wrote a post on LinkedIn uh, recently. You see the, the world of AI and data science and you just think, okay, I need to learn all those things. Like I need to be super good at software engineering, at SQL, at stats, at probability. And you start to get scared because you think there is so much, but actually you don't need to be an expert in everything. You need, as you mentioned, you need a bit of everyone to do a team. So if you're really good at communication and SQL, then you can fit really well within a team where they have some experts in probability and machine learning or something like that. So you don't need to be an expert in everything. You just choose some kind of particular field. Exactly, exactly. Like I would go even further. Like you, you literally just need to learn what is needed to, to pass the interviews. Then you'll learn what, whatever is specific to your role. So why I'm saying that, like you mentioned uh, uh, SQL. Like I've never used SQL. I did have some like one one web programming course in my faculty where we kind of had to use some SQL statements. Like literally, depending on your role, and I had multiple roles already. You may not, you you may like never see some technology. I never had to interact more seriously with that because I I almost never work with structured data. I always work with unstructured data, with images, with text, with videos. So. I never ever had to use it. so I guess that may, may be very surprising to some of your listeners like so so I think it's like just learning tools for tools sake is not that great of an idea unless you know you're going to be working with structured data because there's so many models so many tools you could learn like Gaussian pro let's take like machine learning algorithms like you, you can learn so many algorithms like you can start learning Gaussian processes and Bayesian neural networks and Hopfield networks which are now already extinct quote unquote uh, or deep Boltzmann machines or transformers or GANs or like there is so many models that if you start doing that you'll get nowhere you need to find some way to focus and um, see what your goal is and then depending on your goal curate what you need to learn so if you know you want to work in this cool vision startup don't just go there and learn about Gaussian processes or KNN or like, okay, KNN is maybe like basics. You'll, you'll hear that even in Coursera courses, but like you need to try and focus and understand that the field is so huge that there is no way you can, you can, you can learn everything and you'll just, yeah, give up. Yeah, no. And I agree that also most of the time it's so much easier when you learn something because you're working on it 
for example, during your day-to-day -day job or because you have a project on the side and you need it. If you just learn something for the sake of learning something, uh, first of all, it might never be useful, but that's not a problem because it's always a tool that you can use. But it's also, it won't stick in, it won't make sense and it won't stick in your head as easily because you're just learning about MLOps, but you're never deploying an algorithm or whatever. It's it's not going to be useful. And there are so many tools out there. So yeah, I guess it also depends on your goals. Like, I mean, if you want to be a researcher, maybe being less goal driven is not a bad thing. Maybe mm -hmm. learning for the sake of learning is not a bad thing. Like mm -hmm. you're 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 kind of following your curiosity gradient, if I if you can, yeah, if I can put it like that. And I don't think that's bad per se. It depends on whether you are goal driven, whether you know exactly where you want to be, or you just want to be more like unsupervised, more open ended, and basically depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I would say. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, that that makes sense. And it's, I think it's yeah, it's always good to learn new things, even if you're never gonna use them. It's always a new idea, a new tool, and in the end, you can always use it later on you, you never know what's going to happen well well I, I that's either a bad or a good attitude depending on what where you see yourself in five ten years because but if you, you never know where you will be in five ten years well that's true but like for example if you're trying to start a, start a startup that's going to do machine learning you learning about like sociology or, or okay that's maybe even useful but like <laughs> history or some there there is like there is some level of similarity. You you get kind of have this intuition of what is roughly relevant for the field you're you're going to, and whether you're entrepreneurial type or whether you're a research type. If you're entrepreneurial, you probably don't want to open up some like obscure textbook, like I don't know, and and learn on some ML topic because you'll probably have to know much more. You'll have to know about finance, about legal stuff, about like how to like talk with people, how to do marketing, so many other skills which are much more relevant for your business. Mm -hmm. But if you are a researcher, then opening up that obscure book may happen five years later, will may, may help, help you make some connection and, and create some very cool new architecture or optimization algorithm or whatnot. So again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, whether you're more entrepreneurial or whether you're more towards research or engineering or whatnot. So you, you have to be self-aware i would say and then from there on you'll know how to curate your your own curriculum and what like you need to have this informational diet otherwise you'll just be doing everything and not accomplishing anything all right so let's finish with one advice just one advice for someone to progress in their career if you could just give them one advice what would it be okay i'm gonna be very biased but i'm gonna say be creative with your journey. Uh, try and create your alternative paths. Don't always just follow what other people are doing. Be that, for example, hey, I have to finish bachelor and then master's and then PhD and then postdoc and I'm going to end up in a research lab or whatever. Like, Those are all usual tracks. And by that, I'm not saying they are not good. I'm just saying try and be a bit more like uh, open to alternative paths. And you can also be going... Uh, along those tracks, but be open-ended and in your free time, maybe do all, like some explorations that are non-unconventional. And I, I think that that that's maybe one of the top advice advices I, I would I would give. And learn how to learn on your own. That would be like a second one. Like, yeah, I think learning how to learn is it's kind of something very valuable in the long term. In the short term, you think, oh, I'm just going to learn this because. Um, yeah, it's important. But if you don't learn the process of learning in the long term, you're you're not gonna do well because you're gonna learn things in the wrong way or never gonna remember or exactly. And and also because once you finish your, your faculty, you're on your own. Like all of a sudden now you don't have any structure that somebody else is imposing onto you. You don't have the professor, you don't have that many peers. Now it depends where you end up, basically. But like you have to navigate this mm -hmm. vast space of knowledge on your own and you better learn how to do that efficiently before you end with your faculty i would say that's maybe one of the, the most important things yeah no definitely agree well alexa thank you so much it was amazing to have you on the podcast um yeah have a good evening or even night it's quite late now um and yeah, yeah I'm, to... I'm in the space i'm in the space so yeah, for me so... yeah. <laughs> no time no time for you Awesome. And Thanks a lot, Neil. I appreciate the, the, the invite. 
yeah my pleasure hope to see you very soon